Okay. have a customer computer got some weird lines on the screen so i'm gonna connect my screen up to this computer and see what's wrong first thing to do is disconnect the uh battery here and take their screen out it to my computer okay and test it Computer's got a little dent in the back here. Okay. Right here. There's the problem. Yeah. Oh, hi, it's Chung here. Yes, so I'm just uh, hooking it up to test and I noticed right away there's a big dent in the bottom corner. You probably know that, right? Yes. Okay, but I wonder if, it, usually it should happen right away after the, uh, the dent happens, right? But if it was long ago, but I wonder if it still has anything to do with it. Maybe it uh, somehow affected the screen a little, but... Uh, but uh, in this in this case, not because you've been using it a long time, right? Has this ha, has this problem just started occurring? Okay. Okay. Well, yes, and I'm likely to think that it has nothing to do with it, right? But uh, I wonder if it just compromised the screen just a little. That I don't know, right? But we'll have to test, but okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to test it, and I will let you know. All right? Okay.
Okay. Oops, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I got the wrong computer here. This is the non working computer. This is the This is the computer with the good screen but non working motherboard. Oh, wait. I got this all wrong. Don't I? Got this all wrong. So what I need to do is... Oh. No, no. I had it right. So... I'm... St okay, I had it right. So, I'm still thinking that it's a problem with their screen. And, uh... What I'm doing here is... Looking it up to my good screen here. Yeah, so here's Okay. So this is the screen that and we're gonna use their computer. To power it on. Yeah, using their computer to power it on. Okay, it's power on, power done. Wait a minute, let me see, let me see. The battery's not hooked up, and it's not. Okay, now it's good. There we go, power up. We have power. Okay, so it's working. Okay, just you can see it's fine. Maybe I'll just leave it like this for you guys to you guys to see. Yeah, okay, this is... Who's bottom? This looks like...
Okay. So, are we recording? Yeah, we're recording. So, I'm gonna... see here. Okay. And we're gonna test, uh, we'll do an online, we'll do a, a graphics test. You genie. Uh, heaven. Uh, no, we'll play YouTube. 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 Watch it. Oh. Okay, it's logged into. trying to test this but it's uh it's logged into okay now we're getting into the yes the count So you can see it's their computer is their computer hooked up to this screen okay this computer is not running no hard drive batteries disconnected fan is not spinning okay so huh why is it restart? Okay, there we go. Just want to log into the guest. This computer will restart to a secure Safari only system for the guest user. Safari only. Okay, that's fine. I might have to put my drive in there to see.
connect to the internet okay let's type in YouTube YouTube localized string not found YouTube www dot dot com what the hell why there's internet connection there's wi-fi it's bullshit what a waste of time ah fuck this okay why can't i why can't i log in New window. Then choose a network. Type the network. Maybe it's google.com. Oh, why? Okay, just gonna shut it down. Frustrating. Frustrating. Okay. Boot it from my. Boot it from my external drive. Okay, and let's watch YouTube. National Geographic. There we go, one hour. When school is a place you have to be, why not go to school where remote learning can be as remote as you want? Plants are found
void that oceans are made of. It fills endless depths. Only few will venture out into the endless open ocean of this vast underwater world. Most of the ocean inhabitants live in the city, as it were, like human societies. Very close together, with friendly neighbours and nasty co-tenants. While dangerous robbers lurk around at the edge of town. To assert yourself here, you have to be equipped with all kinds of tricks and clever strategies, or lie and cheat. Coral reefs are the largest structures in the world. They're giant submerged metropolises. Millions of different inhabitants live in these cities. A universe with coral palaces and soaring towers. Every neighborhood has a chief. The entire street belongs to this guy. No trespassing, okay? A typical large city with all the noise and ruckus. Even this little porcupine fish bleats around. It creates this sound with its swim bladder. Two small harlequin shrimps are nibbling on this blue sea star. If someone else shows up, he will catch hell. Another harlequin shrimp busy pulling a bite out of a sea star. Or eight eels in disagreement. A scorpion fish shuffles across the ocean floor. Everything and everybody makes a lot of noise. A boxer crab threatens everybody that comes by, holding two poisonous anemones in its claws. the anemone reef looks peaceful. Or does it? The clownfishes are having a huge squabble. Who does this anemone belong to? We can hardly see this fish, but he's easy to hear. A crocodile fish. Does this giant puffer fish hear something? away. A dispute amongst the members of the cichlid family, who is stronger, and especially who is louder. Two walkman fish are noisily trying to woo a female. Big city noise everywhere especially when a large structure is being torn down. Everybody lives in their own way in this noisy metropolis. Some hover above it all, but others are more down to earth and literally live in the coral sand. These goat fishes, for example, they plough through the ocean floor and catch smaller animals between their teeth. They use their barbels like a dowser, with them, they can detect even the weakest electric fields that point them towards small prey. These gobies also dredge through the sand and feed on what they find in there. 
There's another way of finding prey in the sand. This blue-spotted stingray uses its wings like shovels, and there's always a chance of stealing something. While one works, others just stand by and feed on what's left over, maybe a piece of crab or a mussel. You have to be very familiar with this area to find the best morsels. This triggerfish uses a strong stream of water. The fish blows away the sand to unearth whatever is hidden inside it. Others are quick to steal whatever they can. The triggerfish is a commanding fish, and most reef inhabitants are easily intimidated by him, except for these strange visitors that don't seem to show fear. In any case, it's best to cover them up with sand. for a small fish in a big city. There's always somebody with bad intentions. And you have to be extra careful not to get swallowed, like these moon wrasses, for example. So it's always safer for the smallest among the reef inhabitants to show up in schools. It's difficult to keep an eye out for only one little fish, and as a result the predator often grabs blindly at nothing and becomes up empty. To show up in a big mob is always safest. Others are easily distracted at the sight of so much prey all at once. This easy-going giant puffer fish would never have a chance here anyway. Being part of a school of fish is always the best protection from predators. The slow ones are being ignored. No danger here. school distributes the danger. If there are a thousand fishes, any of them can be the target, and 999 are going to be just fine. But what about loners, or those that live as a couple? Seahorses, for example, camouflage themselves to look like the coral branches they're holding on to. Even more difficult to see, where is the animal here? Only the eye betrays this trumpet fish's camouflage. They do everything to not look like themselves. Ornate ghost pipe fishes. They're inseparable, a couple. The female is already carrying eggs in her extended belly. Before long, the male will fertilize her eggs. They're still regular fishes despite their unique costume. This one looks like torn off seagrass. The spiny wasp fish rocks back and forth in the current. Not a monster, but ingenious camouflage. A spider crab that's decorated its head with a sponge. This will deter any predator. Another great camouflage, a barrel decorated with rocks. Only the movement of the gills betrays this stonefish. 
Even a smack with a fin doesn't bother him. The fish knows it will not hurt him. It only shoves him a little further to the side. Similarly tough are its cousins, the scorpion fishes. They lie there as if dead, especially when others around them freak out. And even when Mori eagles fight with lionfishes for food. The scorpion fish lies in wait for its chance. And then immediately becomes completely motionless again. is that it raises its dorsal fins with the poisonous barbs inside. It's completely still but now also armed. This large anglerfish virtually blends into the background tangle of algae and leaves. Right now the anglerfish is on high alert. It ejects a large cloud in order to throw off predators. It's not the time to feed or catch anything. Its angling rod is lying flat on the fish's back. The white tip at the end of the rod is used to view a prey. The anglerfish feels threatened by something. Finally, it gives up its camouflage and moves further over, using its fins to float. As soon as the fish retracts the fins, it sinks to the ocean floor. Anglerfishes come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Their trick is ingenious, using the angling rod as a lure, and every curious little fish becomes dinner. Many animals, including ocean inhabitants, communicate with a mixture of sounds and behavior. Everybody has to look out for their own survival in this metropolis of ocean inhabitants. But it seems maybe not quite everybody does it by themselves. The partner Gobi has come to an agreement with two pistol shrimps. The Gobi keeps an eye on things while the shrimps keep maintaining their hold. Larger rocks at the entrance are ideal for securing it. They're an experienced team. The shrimps keep in constant contact with the goby and even massage the fish's belly. The goby will get nervous without these gestures from the shrimps. The pistol shrimps need a cool and collected bouncer at their entrance. This is where the anemones settle with their poisonous tentacles. Whoever gets caught by those will pay for it dearly or lose their life. No wonder that there is virtually no one who likes to settle here. The little clown fishes are the only ones that know how to deal with these tentacles. They cover themselves with the slime of the enemy's tentacles and are protected from the poison. The clowns are safe in here and in return will protect their anemone as well as they can. This seems like a sensible deal. But on occasion the anemone will pull the tentacles inside its column-shaped body, which means the clownfish's home is gone. When this happens they panic and look for another anemone that they can hide in for the time being. Unfortunately, this one is already occupied, and the next one as well, and this means having to fight its current owner. There's much to lose for the clowns. Without the anemone, they can't procreate. The clownfishes attach their eggs to the bottom of the column-shaped foot of their anemone, hidden behind the poisonous tentacles. Go 
both male and female tend to the eggs. They found fresh water on them. The eyes of the babies are already clearly visible. The clowns are very protective of their eggs. It takes the two of them to protect their offspring, and only in conjunction with the anemone. Everybody in the reef has to take special care of their young. If they don't, it means their species will simply die out. So it's not surprising that everybody gives it their best effort. Oh, this triggerfish has hidden its offspring in a small hollow in the sandy ocean floor. And this means having to constantly protect this open egg site. On occasion, they blow and fan the eggs, but mostly they keep an eye out for predators. This means grave danger. One of the sea urchins is wandering straight towards the nest. The eggs have to be protected at all cost, but how? The triggerfish seems to consider the alternatives. blows and then rams the sea urchin. Again and again until it breaks, the sea urchin's guts spill out into the open. A few more hits for good measure. The danger has been averted. Everything else is easy. Damsel fishes cling to a coral branch, a pretty and obviously inseparable pair. They appear to have something important to do. And there it is. The female has been laying eggs and glued them to a coral branch. Over and over again, both of them sweep past the eggs to keep them clean. very busy parents in the middle of town. Not far from them, the same kind of damselfish, but this one is feeding on the eggs, not tending to them. This damselfish's priorities have changed. Its partner is gone, and it's impossible to bring the eggs through by itself. So it feeds on its own eggs to at least recycle the nutrients. There are many different strategies to give one's offspring a good start. Some are surprisingly easy. The mass mating of the black sea breeds. The males are so generous with their sperm that often a cloud of it will engulf the entire wedding party. countless couples and constantly in motion. A predator would have a hard time to find its bearings in this schooling behavior. The fish's instincts cause them to mass mate in order to ensure the survival of their species. Cardinal fishes have their own clever means of child protection. It's not time yet. The couple are still flirting and courting with each other, going around and around. We'll leave them to it and take a detour to a couple not quite as gentle with each other. Monkfishes live in groups and their nests are very close to one another. As a result, all the fishes are alerted to a predator nearing their nests. Hermit crabs love to feast on the eggs of the monkfishes, so the protective parents are all getting nervous. The hermit crab 
Archive is still far enough away. I'm currently busy with something else. The Hermit Crab's best defense is its house that it carries around for protection. The patience of the monkfishes is wearing thin. Now everyone attacks in order to bowl the crab away from their nests. They're clearly telling this hermit crab to take a hike, but they should have stayed with their offspring, because there's new danger approaching. The gaggle of rainbow wrasses takes advantage of this unique opportunity and ravages the monkfish nests. The predators are quick, brutal, and in the majority. Most of the monkfish eggs will be devoured. An attack of this kind would never happen to the cardinal fishes because they are mouth brooders and don't have to watch over a nest that's out in the open. The males carry the eggs in their mouths, up to 20,000 of them. A mobile nursery. They're safe here in their father's mouth, unless of course he gets eaten. During the night, when it's dark, the danger is greatest. These underwater cities have a very active nightlife, with special attractions. Basket starfishes come out and sit in the current. It's a night active type of brittle star. With their arms full of tiny little hooks, they filter plankton out of the water to feed. star. It's on the move to find a better spot to filter plankton. This Spanish dancer is even more graceful and elegant than the brittle stars. It's a type of nudibranch. The fish is relaxed and spends the night dozing off on the sandy bottom. Others prefer the safety of their quiet bedroom, a surgeon fish. Everybody settles in for the night as comfortably as possible. The parrot fish tucks itself away in its mucus cocoon for protection against predators. Everybody's sleeping arrangements are different. The poor triggerfish has to stand guard by its nest all night long. There's no time to rest. Some of the predators are quite soft-footed. A cone snail has spotted a small fish. snail is fast, and the prey disappears in the blink of an eye. The night is still young, and still full of danger and terror. These lionfishes pose danger to the cardinal fishes. Lionfishes suck in their prey. even if they choke on it. They're hanging around, waiting for their chance. This poor cardinal is sideways in the lionfish's mouth eggs and all. Lion 
fishes aren't the most elegant predators with all their attachments and frayed fins. But this is all part of their camouflage. They're harder to see and blend into the background. Outside the reef, the lionfishes hunt a swoop. They drive their prey towards one another with their fanned out fins. They prefer to attack from above, cornering their prey. This is not a different location, just different light. These special blue lights totally change the appearance of the reef. Now we can see that the coral polyps are bright red and they clearly stand out from their environment. A new and fascinating perspective on the communication of many ocean inhabitants. And suddenly an eruption of sorts. like smoke, but in reality it's a type of reproduction. A carpet anemone is ejecting its sperm. In the blue light it looks like a dramatic eruption. A hermit crab as a magic lantern. light brings out these colors. An entire group of lionfishes on a food foray. The animals don't seem to know any fear. It seems that they're well aware of the poison they carry in their back spines. They even use the light of our dive torches to their advantage. There's no nightly rest to be had here. With the first daylight, new life comes into the reef city. seem to start going again, ponderously with armoured fins. As pedestrians, and as light and quiet as possible. Mother and daughter, elegant and seamless. Some have to hustle along on ten legs. This spider crab runs straight into a brittle star gathering. A giant smasher in the early morning. Wildly flopping around, everybody tries to get away. As in every city, there are also shopping opportunities here. This moray eel knows her shops well. She rushes to her favourite store every morning. The same with this blue spotted ray. But they haven't opened yet. It leans on one fin as if to say, it's waiting. Similar problems in a branch further up. These sweet lips are also waiting to be tended to. Here they come, a little late this morning. The small, cleaner wrasses are starting to open their shop and are hungry. They're ready to rid their customers of parasites. This ray is also being served. 
It likes to have its gills clean. This is a barter business. One side gets cleaned, the other fed. A very fair deal. Clown fishes seem to be excluded from this business because they can't leave their anemone. In their case, the cleaner fishes make house calls. This snake eel is also otherwise engaged, and the cleaner shrimps are also making house calls for him. Finally, it's the Moray's turn. It has a lot of nutritious freeloaders on its skin and in its gills. All of a sudden, the cleaners leave. Why? This Titan Triggerfish is no better off. The treatment has stopped before he was finished. The cleaner fishes have new customers, clients that have never come to see them before, and they're now being preferred over old customers. The point is that these new clients will like the service here so much that they will come back again. The regular customers have to be patient and wait until the new clients are finished. Cleaner fishes operate solely according to economic rules. This guy has also come for the first time and quite enjoys their service. Yeah, Some gonna start it too. too much of a good thing. This small black spotted puffer just wants to look around and is not asking for a cleaning at this time. It swims away quickly and clearly annoyed. It's time to go back to the regular customers before they get impatient and leave for good.